Here's this creature standing there, seven and a half, eight foot tall, 400 pounds. I started hearing footsteps behind me. It was standing there like this, soaking up the sun. I was gonna see it come out, see something come out of the woods. I just had this feeling someone's gonna walk right out. And I see this huge man-like figure step between two trees, kind of look at us. I saw what I thought was the most awesome, hugest, detailed Bigfoot cutout you could possibly see. Where do you believe <clears throat> Bigfoot comes from. I mean, what do you think Bigfoot is? I mean, there's a lot of speculation as to what Bigfoot as a, as a being is. Um, some believe he's an ape. Some believe he's part man. I mean, what, what do you personally believe? I do believe the best story that I have is uh, <clears throat> if they're biblical, actually. And maybe I've mentioned to that Esau and the Edomites, mm -hmm. Genesis 25, uh, the twin brothers, um, when Rebecca was pregnant, uh, they fought and uh, she was told that she was going to be the mother of two nations. Well, this world has had multiple nations, but if you look at it in terms of Jacob's heritage, which was smooth skin like us, and then the all hairy red man like uh, Esau was, if he in fact mixed with the giants, the Nephilim, You've got a, you've got a, a, a being there. You know, it's just, it's a biblical reference. There's no proof, but uh, just the same. I think it's a great possible heritage, particularly if you believe in the Bible. There's yeah. some history there that you can believe. You know, of course, I've, we've attended the United Methodist Church since since we moved here, and and uh, I think that's to me there's the best explanation. Very, it's particularly, particularly when the dad said Esau would live away with from Earth's blessings and he would live by the sword, and that describes Bigfoot right to a T. Mm. You know, we we really enjoy you know cake and ice cream and and all the culture, all the I mean, not the whole race does, but for most of us, we are so fortunate to have comfortable homes and right. and food and you know. Um, but, but if you had to live in a hole in the ground and uh, eat dry roots <laughs> yeah. or just leaves off the trees yeah. and be almost as smart, if not smarter than us, yeah. that'd be pretty sad. It's an interesting concept too, you know, if yeah. you, look at, you look at the book of Daniel, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was sent out to essentially live like a Bigfoot. Oh, did he? Oh, I, um, I missed yeah, that. Yeah, there's a, there, you, should, you should look into it, there's a story about um, he was essentially cursed by God, and uh, he went out for seven years. Oh, did it he? That his hair grew long, his nails grew really? long. Really? I'm going to look at Daniel. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. And then, uh, and then after the seven years, he came back and was he, he dedicated the rest of his life to, to living for the Lord. But it's an, inter it's an interesting concept. Well, the thing that, that uh, is interesting, if you look at several books of the Bible, they really, the writers really condemn the Edomites. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a big mm -hmm. fight uh, between the Ed Edomites and the and the chosen people, the, mm -hmm. the Jewish nation. Over the years, they really had a lot of fights. Um, in today's age, I think the the Bigfoot knows that we have terrible weapons, including a whole bunch of hunting weapons. You know <laughs> that yeah. they better stay away from us because the average reaction is to start shooting. Even when you only got a 22, you know, yeah. it's just stupid. Got an 800 pound monster and you yeah. shoot at him with a little tiny pea shooter. And the people do that, you know, and that seems to be the natural reaction. And if he was actually threatening the person, that makes sense. But in many cases, they, they aren't, you know. All right, so just start by saying your name and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your experience with Bigfoot. Uh, my name is Brian Gosling. I'm, I'm a local here. Uh, I'm the police officer back in August of 1976 that had the up close personal encounter on A Bear Road. And uh, after that fact, there was people older than me at the time because I was 24. Now I'm almost 72. That came forward, and for a good month after the initial sighting on A Bear Road, there were re reports on a certain road would be County Route 11 and A Bear Road. 
probably another dozen or so reports of people seeing things, stepping across fences you and I got to climb across. Uh, we, my wife and I wrote a book, it's called A Bear Road, The True Story, because the original story on documentaries and books that have been written is so far-fetched and so far out of whack, they've taken the main, the main purpose for the book we wrote is the facts because I'm the one that had the encounter, not everybody else. My words are my words, not your words. Uh, it, we're still into it big time. In fact, we got a couple of casts on the table over there, which is a godsend to us because we haven't come down here anything new since 1997 or 98. And that was at West Mountain. These two are from this July. And it's two different ones in the same location. A gentleman owns a camp back in here and there. He's from Connecticut. He wanted us to investigate it, and we did. We finally, he called us near the end of June, and we, you know all the, I don't know if you guys are from the area, but all the rain we had up here was tremendous. So we went down, I think it was the first, first week, week and a half of July, down in the area. I did find bear tracks that was headed down this really steep embankment. Then it goes into a marshy bog full of hemlock, 99% hemlock in there. You know what that's like walking on for us, yeah. a waterbed. And we couldn't leave any tracks whatsoever, so my wife and I were doing our investigating. And she found one on the back side of the tree. And this, the one I found was off the left-hand side of the tree in the front, and they're two different size tracks, and I take it as an adolescent. And I mean, a female, or excuse me, an adult. And the guy actually come up from Connecticut today, because he's got a camp back there. And this all transpired while he's in his outhouse outside his camp. And he was scared the kabooters out of it. And so we went over and said, we'll do an investigation, which we did. And we actually come up with two casts. We've never been able to do that before. We've got a lot of casts, not here. We've only got a handful here. But to find more than one, that was a godsend, especially for the new festival. And if you want to look at the cast, you can. They're right there on the table. Yeah, we definitely will. And so obviously your, your story was something that really kind of was, uh, it brought a lot of news to the town. Oh, yeah. um, a lot of news to the to the Bigfoot community. Yeah. Um, that night, I mean, what were kind of your first impressions when you when you saw it? it I mean, what was what 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 was first running through your mind? Now, I, I was the second night. I was off duty, my own car. The night before, I was on duty. I couldn't leave the village unless I were in pursuit or backing up a call that the troopers or sheriffs couldn't cover. And the guys that come in just happened to be my brother and a friend of his. My dad had just gotten off duty, it was midnight or so after the fact. And uh, they come in and told me I thought they were full of kapooey. And my encounter, the night I had my encounter, the trooper that was out there with me, he was on duty. He was probably 2,000 feet away from me or so up on top of a hill, out in a field a little bit, 50 feet off the road, where I was 400 feet or so out in a field that hadn't been mowed that year by the farmers. My first, my first thought was, you got you to live it with me because something told me to turn my spotlight on now. Something just told me to do it. And right off the kitty corner of my car, here's this creature standing there, seven and a half, eight foot tall, 400 pounds, maybe more, maybe a smidgen less, staring at me. And as soon as I brought, hit it with my spotlight, it brought his hands up like this, put his head back, and just laid out such a deep, guttural from the bottom to the top of the scale and it lasted probably 10 15 seconds and at 30 feet i guesstimated it was 30 feet it was just like me blowing a tuba right directly in your face i could feel it in my chest mm -hmm. i had my hand up the hammer pulled back on the gun and all i could hear in my head believe it or not I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. And while all this is going on, I'm standing there looking at something that don't exist. I didn't go out as a complete non-believer. Why should I dis disbelieve my brother, his friend? My father was a sergeant here in Whitehall. Two New York State troopers, two deputy sheriffs that all saw it. Mm -hmm. Why should I doubt them? But I went out for my own curiosity, and it's the trooper that went out with me, and he was on duty. Went out for my own curiosity, and thank God I stayed where I did. For months and months and months after that, we were all made fun of, and yeah, you know, and these same guys that are uh, made fun of me are, are some of the, not the, the festival, but different things we used to have in the park, whittling little Sasquatches and all that stuff, making money off it, see. 
And I embarrassed one guy so bad that the people that were buying things put them back down and walked away from the table. I said, there's one of the guys who used to make fun of me all the time and the rest of the family. But anyway, you'll hear the whole complete story at 4 o'clock. I'll relive it again. I'll never forget it. Right from the instance I left that road and got out in that field, the whole nine yards, I, it's etched up here forever. All right, we're here with David, and David, you told us that you have seen Bigfoot, and uh, it's a long story, but you're going to give us like the trailer version, correct? Exactly right. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I possibly can. This happened in the summer of 2015. I live near Boston. It happened in a town called Weston on Church Street. I've lived there my whole life, never saw it before, haven't seen it again. Driving over this small bridge over an abandoned railroad track, I was driving with my girlfriend at the time and my sister. Someone told me, look down, there it was, standing on the edge of the abandoned railroad tracks. It wasn't standing behind a tree or in the woods, it was right there. At least eight feet tall, 450 pounds. Just standing there watching that occasional car go over that bridge. Driving over the bridge, I said, you guys, did you see that? And they were too busy talking, two women. They're like, see what? I made a U-turn, we parked right there, we watched it for a good five minutes. Here's the most, <laughs> this is... I can't even talk because I get too excited about this. But here we go. This is how I know it wasn't a bear standing on two legs. And I know it wasn't a guy in a costume because here we go. I saw it plain as day. Again, it was about 75 feet away down below us. And we're sitting in the safety of our car. My sister to this day said she saw a silhouette of it. And I hate to use the word blurry, but she saw like a blurry silhouette of the same thing that I saw perfectly. My girlfriend at the time didn't see it at all. We all had the same exact view. How do you explain that? Here we go. I've always believed. It shows itself to you if you believe in the thing, okay? My sister's always been right down the middle of the road. She kind of saw it, but she didn't see it. My girlfriend at that time never believed in ghosts, aliens, or Bigfoot. She didn't see it at all. Three different experiences with the same exact view. That fits like the perfect jigsaw puzzle piece, okay? So in other words, you could probably walk right by the thing, unless you might smell it, okay? <laughs> you wouldn't even know it was there if you don't believe in it. Well, so. well, let me ask you this. So I grew up deer hunting, as you do in New England. And um, one of the things that I noticed when I would deer hunt is I would see things that I thought were a deer or bear or whatever, right. but it wasn't. Sure. So, I mean, you said, like, if if you want it to see it, you'll see it, or do you think that sometimes maybe you think you see something because you want to see something? Well, I wasn't even looking for it. It's something just told me, look, as I drove over the bridge and it caught my eye. Again, it was like eight feet tall, 450 pounds, okay? So, like I say, it was weird. The whole thing was, it's life-changing when you have this kind of experience. And I know what I saw, and I can't say this enough, I don't do drugs, I wasn't drinking, and I'm not delusional. I'm a little out there, I've seen a lot of stuff in my life, sometimes with people, sometimes by myself. But trust me, this was the most intense moment of my life, and I'm now I'm 63 years old. That it was the most intense five minutes of my entire life, and I've seen a lot of things, and been a lot of places. But that is absolutely true story. Take it to the bank. And. Uh at the time, were you convinced it was Bigfoot, or did you kind of have to think about it a little bit more? It was 100% Bigfoot, man. I mean, it was the brown fur, dark brown face, longer arms. It wasn't jumping around, but you could see it was alive. It was just standing there. Like I say, it was just curious about that occasional car that was going over the bridge. Again, this was in the town of Weston, Massachusetts, on Church Street. And now today, it's a very popular rail trail. And when I go over that bridge, what, I, what do I see? All day long, there's people jogging, running, rollerblading, but usually when the sun's going down, just the same time I saw it, there's usually a, a very young, pretty girl with headphones on by herself going down that rail trail. I would not be doing that if I was her, if she'd seen what I'd seen. I don't think so, okay? Do you think, do you think Bigfoot would eat her? Like, do you think Big, let me ask you this, do you think Bigfoot is harmful? Is it just trying to let, let us live our life? Is it trying to live its own life? That's a very good question. I think just like in the real world, there's good people and bad people, and I think this, I think some, big feet, big foots, whatever you want to call them, are just curious and they don't mean you any harm. Whereas others, maybe not so much, okay? I think this one was just 
just wanted to like see the cars, you know, it didn't mean any, it was just curious, it was just standing there, like it had never seen cars before. And then, uh, do you think that Bigfoot has any like supernatural powers at all? Yeah, well, like, this is the ability, how I could see it, and my girlfriend couldn't see it at all. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy, and I'm looking at her like she's crazy. It was like, how can you not see it? It's like right there. <laughs> it's like, so what are you going to do? You know? Well, I appreciate you telling your story. Um, like I say, it was a pleasure. And like I say, also that summer, I learned so many years later, one of the Western police saw the same thing on the other side of town in a swamp. Okay, so I saw it, and a cop saw it. So there you go. Take it to the bank. <laughs> right on. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm Emily. I am uh, owner of the Forest Fleur, which is a Bigfoot research company. Uh, it started about six years ago when I was super interested in Bigfoot. Um, and now my mission really is to spread awareness about this animal, this species, uh, in order to um, inspire habitat conservation. There's a little bit of uh, suspicion as to what Bigfoot actually is. So I have heard some people say that it is, uh, it's an ape. Some people say that it's uh, more closely to a man. I've ha heard some people say um, that it's even human. Um, what is your view on, on what kind of species Bigfoot is um, or what it closely would, would relate to? Well, evidence points us to the conclusion that Sasquatch or Bigfoot is an ape. Uh, there are three piece of, pieces of evidence that tell us this. Um, there are footprint casts, right, and those show unique anatomy in the form of midfoot flexibility. So we see something called a mid-tarsal break within these footprints that tells us that Sasquatch feet move like ape feet. We also have hair samples that are very close to human and also chimpanzees. And another thing we see is throughout these prints and also on windows and cars, um, Sasquatch hand fingerprints are left uh, and they're called dermal ridges. That's what scientists call them. So we see dermal ridges in hand and footprint casts as well as on windows after a Sasquatch has visited that area. So all of these things point to Sasquatch being an ape. They're also hair covered they have forward-facing eyes, and they have no tail, which describes an ape species. So whether they're closer to human or other great apes is still a mystery, and we need more data to find out. From the stories that I've heard, it's almost as if when someone does have an encounter <coughs> with Bigfoot, they're never really looking. It just kind of happens. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a, kind of a fair assessment? It yeah, I think I think if you go out looking for it and you you do what you know, like any of these TV shows that are that are produced and have personalities in it, you you know they're out there, they're doing whoops and they're doing tree knocks and they're doing all kinds of stuff to try to elicit a response so that they can record it. I think having talked to a lot of people and read a lot and listened to a lot, it seems that people who just go out into the wooded areas and just be. Just do your thing. Just go there, and if it, if you're out there to fish, fish. If you're out there to relax and then you know do a campfire with your family, that's when it seems like those types of things start to make themselves known. Yeah. It's almost like if you're out there with the intent of trying to elicit a response, they're gonna they don't want nothing to do with it. You know. Now you talk about hunting, and I hunted for a while. Um, and this would have been in my uh, mid-40s. I hunted a, a very small piece of property. It was very, very narrow and very long. And it was right outside a, uh, a high school area, to be honest with you. It butted up against a, a piece of farm property. And I did not have permission to hunt the adjacent property. But it was a really interesting piece of property. And for some reason, I would sit on pretty much on the, you know, a few yards, yards off the borderline of the two, two properties. And I would always find myself compelled to look at that property. And, you know, there was, there was a regular woods, and then there was a strip of, of pine trees that was rather wide. And then he had a little bit of a worn path, which seemed to be a pretty heavy game trail. And then behind that, there was another short row of trees, oaks, and, and maples. And then beyond that, and this was all a relatively short distance, beyond that there was some very tall grass and some marshy wetlands. And when you would look at the, 
the wetland area, you could see where the deer would bed down at the night because you could see all the, all the, the grass was down. And it just always interested me really for some reason. I don't, and I'm not, I'm not a freak about properties. You know, it's right. just, it's not something I, I normally like, well, I want to go yeah. see that property. And uh, so it was getting pretty late in the day, had about maybe 25, 30 minutes left of, of hunting time. And I set my, I set my shotgun down and I left my, my blind. It was actually a deadfall, a, a tree that was really thick tree that just had fallen over and the, the canopy of the tree created a, a very nice uh, blind. I left my, my weapon there and I stepped onto the property that I did not have permission to hunt. And I just wanted to see the property. I just wanted to walk into it. And uh, so I started walking and I would say I maybe got maybe 50, 55 yards down this game trail. And as I looked up, through the corner of the trees, a little opening in the trees, I, I could see the corner of the house. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm far enough. So I turned around and I started to walk back. And it was a slow walk. I was, I was in no hurry. And I don't know, maybe a third of the way back to, to my property, I started hearing footsteps behind me. And I immediately just kind of, I stopped. And I made sure that my hands were down at my side so you could see I wasn't holding the weapon. And I was sure that it was the landowner. Right. And I was just waiting for him to light me up. Yeah. I was just waiting for him to just start tearing me apart yeah. for being on his property. And, and he should have, yeah. you know. But he didn't say anything. And I waited there for a second, made sure that I had my, on my hands at my side, and I started walking again, slowly. And after one or two steps, I start hearing step, 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 yeah. crunching in the, the leaf litter on the, on the game trail. And uh, I stopped again. And it took maybe one or two steps and it stopped. And at this point, I mean, I had already been into Bigfoot for a long time, but Bigfoot was not in my mind at all because I was in a very small town yeah. right outside of... Uh, the property of a, a high school where my kids went to school. And uh, it was just, and, and then it hit me and I was like, oh my God, this is a huge 12 point buck. He smells deer estrus on my, yeah. on my clothing and he's following me back to my seat. Yeah. And I was like, my heart just started pounding. Yeah. I'm like, this is the biggest deer anybody has ever seen. <laughs> I'm going to be on <laughs> newspapers and magazines. And so I, I just, I mean, I started slowly walking again and I heard crunch, 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 crunch. Eventually get back to this deadfall where my gun was. And I had, a, I had a bucket that I was sitting on and I never turned around. But now I'm thinking, how am I gonna reach my, my shotgun with the least amount of movement? Right. Because I don't wanna spook it. Right. So, I was able to reach, grab the barrel of my shotgun, I pulled it up like this, flipped the safety off, and in my head I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to take one step back with my left leg, I'm going to turn at the waist at the same time, it's going to be right there in front of me, I'm going to take the shot, it's going to be in the chest, but he's close enough and it'll go through. Yeah. And I went, and I just barely turned, and I heard this and I hear thump thump and I, I turned and there's nothing there's nothing and I'm, I'm like looking around and I'm looking for a I'm looking for a big white tail right. running away from me and all I ever heard was boom boom I heard two I didn't hear four I didn't hear eight I didn't hear 16 I didn't hear it taken off down the trail right. all I heard was thump thump after a really really loud exhale and and I start looking for, I start looking for like twigs bouncing, or a leaf, you know, Some floating back down to the, yeah. to the ground or something. And there was nothing, huh. absolutely nothing. And I'm like, what in the hell? So, you know, I'm 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 all jacked up. My heart's beating really quick. And again, I'm still not I'm not thinking Bigfoot at all. 
And I'm like, oh my God, that was the biggest deer anybody would have ever seen. Yeah. And uh, so I stepped three steps back in to the property that I didn't have permission. I had my shotgun and I'm looking into the woods. It could have gone far because it didn't, right. you didn't hear it running off into the distance. And I'm looking, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I can't see anything. Finally, I, I walk back. I walk out of that woods into the, um, the grassy area that's maintained. And I started walking back down the, the row of trees to go back to my car, which was about 125, 135 yards. And I'm walking along the edge of the, the tree line. And as I'm walking, I'm hearing steps in the in the leaves in the tree line and I had a pretty decent flashlight I pulled it off my head and shining and it's not completely dark yet I mean it's getting there but and I'm I'm shining the light in there as I'm walking and and I can hear it I don't see a damn thing there's there's no squirrel there's no deer there's no turkey because there's a lot of turkey roost in that area it's and it followed me two-thirds of the way to my car and then it stopped but when i got very close to the back of the garage that the house yeah. that was on that property that's when it that's when it stopped yeah so it didn't go it didn't go beyond that into and it wasn't until a couple of years afterwards where i started kind of putting it together and it's like that's why you know like with my show and you know really big shows like sasquatch chronicles or listening to steve isdall on on youtube when he e reads emails from people who have had experiences it's it's constant um constantly putting together what you've heard right. that makes sense and and he always calls them puzzle pieces and and literally literally they are because it was kind of all at once that it dawned on me it's like okay so i had i had two footsteps behind me it didn't sound like a horse trotting it didn't you know right. and if you listen to a deer walk and a horse walk it's very similar other than the the clip clop yeah. from the the hooves um when you add two extra legs into it, it doesn't sound like a human walking. Right. And this sounded like, I, you know, at first, I honestly, I thought it was the landowner. And, and then I convinced myself that it was a deer, but it was always just crunch, crunch, right. yeah. crunch, crunch. And it wasn't until a couple of years after that that I kind of put it all together and I was like, yeah. was wow. it, was it? Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know, but when you start hearing, and, and I guess you can, you know, I guess it's easy to draw a point from A to point B without it being true, right. but sometimes, like, the simplest answer is the, is the right answer, you know? I mean, yeah. if, you try to, if you try to read too much into it, you're possibly missing. missing so, I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot. It, it, it was really odd. Tell me about your experiences. I know you said you had a sighting with Bigfoot. Tell me a little bit about that, um, some different vocalizations you've heard, kind of uh, the evidence that you've, you've seen or heard, um, and kind of what your, your most uh, credible sighting or um, your most credible experience with Bigfoot has been. Sure, so my first encounter with Bigfoot was on Prospect Mountain in the Lake George area of New York. Um, I was there on the off season early uh, April, and I was with a, a research partner of mine and you know at the time we were really just two friends out hiking um we weren't you know full-blown researchers yet but we're walking down the road it's about six o'clock in the evening and i said hey let's practice our sasquatch calls so you know we start woo, you know going off with our calls and something starts answering us, which was really incredible. So that went on for about 15 minutes. Um, and then we got the heck out of there because we were scared. Um, now, if that happened to me, I would have stuck around to see what it was. But I think that that was probably a Sasquatch. And what validated that were my experiences in Oregon when I was studying there for four months under some really amazing researchers, one of which is my research partner today. So. 
out in Oregon, we were in the Mount Hood National Forest in an area that there had been a ton of sightings. People were casting footprints. Um, you know, this research group I was studying under was yielding a lot of evidence out of this area. And so they brought me along to show me. Uh, we were driving down old logging roads where we heard some incredible vocalizations. And I also had an experience where we heard some rock clacking coming from the tree line. And then all of a sudden I heard an ape-like grunt and smelled this very pungent ape-like odor. So I've had a few experiences out there but perhaps the most um, amazing experience I had was seeing one in the middle of the night. Uh, it was uh, almost midnight and we were out on private property that we had um, exclusive access to. And, you know, we're walking around, all of a sudden we hear cracking and crunching and, you know, quietly, but it was definitely there. Something was walking through the woods. And before I knew it, I'm staring into the tree line. The moonlight is beautiful and bright. You could see kind of in between each tree. And I see this huge man-like figure step between two trees, kind of look at us and then walk off. It was the most incredible experience. And at the time I thought, there's no way that could have been a Sasquatch because it was too big. Yeah. And afterwards we measured it was about seven and a half foot, which puts it in the range of an adult male Sasquatch. But, you know, in the moment, you just, you can't imagine the size of them until you see one yourself. Do you feel as if going out looking or hunting for Bigfoot is possibly destroying Bigfoot's habitat and maybe could prevent the race from or the no, itself, no. The from I just don't, you know, certainly we've had a, quite a bit of urbanization and it does take away from habitat, but it is surprising. Gabe is going to talk here another hour and he's found a surprising amount of habitat evidence of Bigfoot in the metro areas. Many of these big cities have swamps that are ideal be, uh, Bigfoot habitat. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people really hate it when they drive through the state land. Here's these clear cuts, which there's no question it's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> but the DNR does that to regenerate the growth because deer, birds, Bigfoot, everything survives on young growth. My wife and I actually live in a pine forest where there's 80 foot pine trees and uh, the undergrowth is minimal. There's nothing, you know, deer wander through in the spring when they're really hungry and eat it, but there's really no f good forage there. It's good for the tree dwelling birds and uh, like that, uh, or squirrels that eat pine cones, which many of them do, but and I'm not so sure Bigfoot doesn't either, but uh, Clear, clear cuts, they're ugly, but you usually if it's in decent ground in five years, you can't see through it. You can't do bird hunting, it's too thick. And you look at the, the new growth, you know, it'll be 10 foot tall and you can't see and you got all kinds of new growth and that's what Bigfoot eats. Yeah. They're herbivores. I mean, they eat everything, they eat animals too, but, but uh, the herbivore, feature of it, you wouldn't go, you couldn't find a better place for a Bigfoot. I often think I'm going to do more hiking and cut over yeah. areas that, you know, but I never get around. Usually when I get around to it, it's too hot and you can't really bird hunt it. And, uh, and uh, some of these really in good soils, you could have a whole family of Bigfoot laying out there. You wouldn't even know it. Nobody goes through it. No people go through it because you can't bird hunt. And it's really, in many cases, it's so thick, it's very difficult to walk in. My name is Don. My wife and I live over in Hale. Um, my story, it's really short and simple. Um, took my daughter's cat one morning in late February, took my daughter's cat in to have him snip snip. And I was feeling really bad about that. And uh, driving back, it was still early morning because you get the cat there early and then you can take him home. You don't have to spend the night. So I'm driving back and the sun's up. And I've been telling my wife for a couple of months that I wanted to get a Bigfoot cutout to put in our yard, you know, off to the side of the woods. You see them around here and there. 
And I'm driving down the road. I'm familiar with the road, familiar with the area. I even had permission to hunt for years across the street from where I seen the thing. I had permission to hunt that property for years. Um, and I'm driving along, and I and I just happened to the, my window was kind of frosted up. It was one of the coldest mornings of the of the of the winter, and I saw what I thought was the most awesome, hugest. Uh, detailed Bigfoot cutout you could possibly see. I was like, holy crap, this thing's going to cost me 200 bucks to reproduce because it was so big. That one fellow was talking about, the, the, the one I, what I saw was all a nine foot. And its, its hands were down like this. It had its back to me. And thinking back, because I've thought about it a lot since then, what it was doing, there was a ray of sun that was coming through the trees, and knowing what I know, it was standing there like this, soaking up the sun, I believe, because it was so damn cold. I mean, it was cold. It was like 8 or, eight or 10 below zero that morning. And, uh, but I thought at the time that it was a Bigfoot cutout. That's what I thought it was. And I thought, I'm going to turn around and, and take a look at that. And, uh, and then I thought, no. I'll, I'll go get her out of bed, and then we'll go together. And then I got up to the next mile road. I said, no, I'm going to go look at that. So I turned around, and I'm driving back. And I, like I said, I'm familiar with the area, and I'm looking right where I know it was, and I don't see it. And I'm still not putting 1 plus 1 equals 2. I'm still thinking I saw a very detailed Bigfoot cutout. And then it hit me. It's gone. It's not there. Whatever this was is not there. And we had just gotten snow. There was two or three inches of fresh snow. And looking back, I should have got out of the truck. I didn't want to trespass because it's, it's hunting property. And I'm, I've met the people that own the property. And property boundaries are, you know, sacred for hunting property. But I should have gone because I know there would have been tracks. We had just gotten fresh snow. And it would have been easy to, I mean, there would have been awesome tracks. It was the kind of snow that it would have, you know, there would have been easy to track it. But uh, when I realized it wasn't there, I slowed down and I'm, I'm, the, I'm inching forward. I got my passenger window down. I'm heading the opposite way that I was when I first seen it. And back in the, it's a cedar and conifer, it's a conifer swamp, cedar and spruce and some hemlock. And it's quite thick at the ground level. Like if you bend down like this, you can see to the back wall, but you stand up like this and it's hard to see 15, 20 feet. This thing happened to be standing in a pathway that the property owners had cut to gain access, I assume, from the road. It, th there's even a little drive in there like where they pull a quad runner off the road and then walk so they don't have to walk through the swamp when they go back to their blinds. I, I, that's what this was for. And that's where the sun, so when it was standing there, it was kind of facing the the southeast i guess in the winter when the sun was that far to the south and the, you know the sun was hitting it right in its face obviously that's i mean thinking back and looking back that's exactly what the thing was doing was standing there like this but i, I guess my point or the thing that struck me was the size of it uh, we have nine foot ceilings at my house and i was telling my wife the thing would have a hard time standing up in our house and and like uh, the first fellow that spoke earlier it, his, its hands were down here like this. And I mean, I remember, because it was just a fleeting glimpse, and you got to remember, I didn't think I was looking at a Bigfoot. I thought I was looking at a very detailed Bigfoot cutout that I wanted to reproduce myself. So when I, and then just like your arm, the hair on your arm just stand up, when I think about it, it still does it when I think about it. I, I've, I've been interested in Bigfoot since I was a little kid. Uh, we listened to um, that How to Hunt on, on YouTube and several, all, all, you know, all the popular ones. Um, never in a million years did I ever think I would see a Bigfoot. You know, I never never thought I would. And, I mean, I, 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 I'm 100% convinced of what I saw. It's not your typical Bigfoot country. It's farm fields. But this, there's a little swamp that runs north and south, and I believe the thing was traveling up that that swamp you know so it didn't have to expose itself and plus it's cold i mean it was it was bad that morning you know but uh i guess that's it i still don't have my bigfoot cut out either <laughs> she that was february i'm gonna say 21st 22nd of february of this year just just this year and as the crow flies from this spot 23 miles maybe
as a crow flies, okay? Well, Whitehall, New York is actually what got me into the subject. Uh, my grandparents had a house up in Broad Albin, New York, and my grandmother heard about Whitehall through a friend and how there were Sasquatch sightings in the area. I was fascinated and I just had to come here and find out for myself. I was about 12 years old and I begged my family to take me here. We got to see the Sasquatch statue, we got to talk to a, a gentleman in the local museum, and he told us all about the local sightings and reports from the area. It was an incredible experience. I took home a souvenir with me, a little carved statue of a Sasquatch, and I immediately just fell in love with the subject, and from there it just took off. And how long have you been researching Bigfoot? I've been researching for six years now. Uh, I spent most of my time in the Adirondacks starting out, uh, spent four months out in Oregon learning everything I could about Sasquatch, and now I'm back in the Hudson Valley trying to find evidence there. Phil Shaw has lived in West Branch since 1972. His first interest in Bigfoot came in 2006 when he and his wife saw a probable Bigfoot in New Brunswick on a trip to the Maritime Provinces. Uh, his interest was actually enhanced when two of his sons actually did a humorous uh, mockumentary on Bigfoot, um, which was called the Shaw Bigfoot Project. Since then, Phil has documented over 142 incidents of Bigfoot activity in the six counties around West Branch, uh, which can be seen on his YouTube page, which is Phil O News One. So, Phil, thanks for sitting down with us. Oh, thanks for talking. So I had mentioned um, that you, your first belief in Bigfoot happened uh, in 2006. Yep. And uh, you had told me you were driving along the highway and yep. you and your wife had saw it. Mm -hmm. And your little one-liner was that you knew it was Bigfoot because you and her had never agreed on anything else, that, right? That's what the boy said. <laughs> <laughs> so since then, yeah. What has your experience like and what kind of different encounters have you experienced? Well, I think probably the part of it is the, you know, the number of stories out there of things that correspond with all the books I've read. I've read 106 Bigfoot books, probably got 500 to go. But I've also <clears throat> been in the woods where along a the river, they've thrown rocks into the river by me. I've heard them walk in the river and talking, I think, at midnight type of thing. Uh, one time they broke a tree off by me when I was by myself. When I walked out the trail and here's a broken tree. Um, one time I was camping up by Luzerne with three other guys and I think I got hit with a pine cone. Huh. And the other two guys were at the campfire and and the other fellow was holding a flashlight for me. So, you know, uh, we were a long ways, 30, 40 yards from the wood line. And there was no people. We didn't see any pickups around or anybody else. And I don't, they wouldn't have known what we were doing anyhow, but anyhow, got hit with a pine cone. So it's, and then I recorded, I don't know if you guys listened to about seven minutes of what I call a mad ape in Kentucky. Yep. And I, I think clearly that was, one guy wanted to say it was coy dog, but I don't think a, any kind of dog could have done what I, I was recording there. So yeah, I've had quite a few experiences actually. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't that that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? I say read a book. Dang it, pick a book, <laughs> almost any Bigfoot book. Uh, you know, there's some are better. Dr. Meldrum's book, Sasquatch or uh, Legend Meet Science, probably one of the better ones. But you know, for people to be so positive about something and not make any effort to study it, you know, I really don't care if they believe. But don't be so darn positive unless you're willing to read a book about it and study it. Because if you do any study, you're going to find out there's a lot of good stories. Uh, people that come like something like this, a lot of them got stories. Yeah. Of what happened to them? So, you know, don't, you know, I'm positive they're out there and all over the world. But I've been studying this for going on 14 years or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Me, my son, and him, one of his buddies were down by the riverbank. We were having a fire that uh, evening, just decided to just kind of uh, just relax. 
My mom owns 80 acres on the Augury River, so it'd be right um, about four miles west of Singing Bridge. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And um, there was a footprint in the riverbed, and they were down there playing, and I was doing something else. I was messing with the fire. But I looked down there, and I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, hey, there's a footprint right by there. And uh, my son looks at it, and he's like, whoa. You know, he kind of gets all weirded out by it. Of course, I'm like, you guys are fooling with me. I said, which one of you is that you don't run around barefoot? This is about three weeks ago, so it was still in the mid-40s, very cold. Uh, and they're like, Dad, Dad, no. We, you know, this is, we, didn't, we didn't do it. So this is a picture of what I took. Um, I'll show you. Let's see. I don't know. Maybe I can just pass my phone around if that's fine. Okay. Uh, you can kind of see what I've done a lot of research on this. I'm kind of a Bigfoot crazy freak. Uh, it's got like a mid tarsal break almost, but it was only maybe this big. And the next couple steps, or the step, was actually went into the river. And so whatever it was came up on the bank, was fooling around maybe for a step or two. My son found another one where you could see the foot actually slide down into the river. And me, I, I believe that they probably, in order to stay undetected, will travel the wet river beds, you know, because our property's been there a lot of years. My uncle thinks I'm crazy. He's like, dude, we got bear everywhere. I said, that's no bear track, you know, Al. And so uh, it was just an interesting, I don't know, like I said, it was fascinating to me. But when did this happen? This was only about three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago in uh, Turner, Michigan. So I don't know if you guys know where the, the All Gray River goes over Turner Road right there. My mom owns that first farm on the right-hand side. And It was about, it was, yeah, it was, what was it, Kate, 45, 50? For someone to be running around barefoot at this time would be crazy because it was, it was cold. But I looked at them, I said, you guys are messing with me. No, 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 Dad, I promise. So that's my story. Uh, we've never had any of that. We got a, a picture of an odd tree structure, too, with, with a complete X on the property. Um, actually, the, our neighbors across the river that I took in there, too. Um, we've never had... Uh, sightings or anything or it's odd sounds what i would consider odd sounds and before my dad passed away um he told me a story about one time him and, him and his buddy were in the woods and there was something that was grunting and making loud noises at him this was probably about my dad passed away five years ago so it's probably about seven seven years ago and he knew i was fascinated with bigfoot so he called me first right off the bat he's like something was making noises at us my dad had grew up here and he was never afraid of anything but he said that him and his buddy actually went and got guns because they were concerned with whatever it was was either hurt or extremely dangerous and like i said my dad had lived grew up in this area his whole life they went back and whatever it was was gone about 30 minutes later but it was like actually he said it was like grunting at him grunting danger you know and it's very thick pines back there you can't see anything it's kind of the same thing if you bent down like this you could but if you stand up it's just all thick pines so i don't know uh, believe what you want, but that, that footprint was really quite interesting, I thought. so. Had several in the and, it, it, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Alabaster Swamp, but that's over by the National City. That's like 6,000 acres of uh, just basically state land, and it's really, really swampy. And so, like, the yeah, they call it, yeah. The, we, last year we had Scott, Yeah, so. All right, thank you. Okay, who's next? Come on. All right, there he is. Put the shame on you. Hey, everybody, I'm George. Um, I live uh, about 18 miles, I guess, to the uh, almost directly east of here over in Prescott. And uh, got an 80 acre hunting camp, spending our family about 35 years. And um, I decided about three years ago, you know, I was going to move up there and homestead it. Never had power, just outhouse and the big hunting shack kind of barn thing. And um, so the place has kind of been vacant, you know, nine months out of the year, except for when uh, my dad and his buddies and our family and stuff are there bow hunting and whatnot. Um, but nobody's ever really lived there during the summer. So 
I've had a ton of experiences there. Uh, I guess I'll just, just to make it brief, um, I'll go with the first one and the last one. So first one that kind of like, you know, I, I wasn't really a full on Sasquatch believer or anything. I had, you know, seen some curious things in the woods and listened to stories and whatnot. And I wasn't a disbeliever in any way, uh, but it wasn't really on my radar. Uh, wasn't something I was really thinking about too often. Um, but one night when I initially moved uh, to our property, which was the summer of 2019, um, I would say it was like beginning of August or something, and I had been kind of prepping myself, knowing that the weather's going to change, it's going to start getting cooler, and I got to start thinking about, am I wintering in the barn? And I just had been huddling around uh, this campfire that I just kind of made like my hangout area and we never really had fires there you know um it's a bow hunting camp my dad's a real purist like no one no one slams car doors or anything it's like you do the click and butt bump kind of thing and everybody's really you know and everybody's from downstate you know flatlanders city it's whatever you want to call them um you know so i had to kind of like you know pay my dues to not be called one of those for a little while uh but i um yeah, I was sitting by the fire one evening, and and uh, it was just kind of one of those real starry nights, and uh, and I hear this kind of like low, like a cow kind of sound, like a mmm, as about as good as I can get, but it it was real, real deep and textural, like a cow, and it was off maybe uh, a couple hundred yards to one side of me, and I'm kind of like, oh, I'm trying to think of like where the farms are close by and there's nobody that has cattle right where I'm at. And I'm just outside the village of Prescott and we're kind of up on a hill. So I can hear sounds, um, through some of these kind of like terrain features, uh, pretty good. And, uh, you know, it was off in this big four or five hay fields that there's just never anything in. I kind of hear this boo, and I'm like, huh, what's that? And then, off, say that was at my like 10 o'clock, off about my one o'clock, maybe a hundred yards in, I hear another, a different toned one kind of boo. And I was like, oh, kind of racing through my mind, like somebody's cows got out or, you know, it's maybe, I had, had a couple beers, I was sitting up, it was maybe one or two in the morning, um, you know, so I start running through my mind of like, oh, what could that be? And then the first one goes back again. And I realized there was like a call and response kind of thing happening and moving towards me. It was getting closer. And then a third one chimed in much closer, uh, within like, I would just estimate like 50, 75 yards, meters or so. And I was like, okay, time to go in. And you know, we've got a big barn that I can button up and, and I just, I got freaked out, but I still hadn't really put, you know, Sasquatch in my mind yet I was I was just running through loose cows uh, like man do we have a feral hog problem what what could this be what could this be and uh so I I went in the upstairs and we have a sliding door balcony kind of thing and I and I was tiptoeing and creeping all lights out and um and I got my guns out and I laid out on the balcony and I got a pretty high powered assault rifle and a 30 30 and then my little pea shooter pistol and I'm laying there and I'm like looking out at our kind of pasture area and then there's the pine these really thick pines and kind of those sounds are coming right at me moving and I uh and the thought popped into my head man could that be Bigfoot you know like if it is it's multiple and then the la and then the next thought was I was going to see it come out, see something come out of the woods. I just had this feeling someone's going to walk right out. And the thought popped into my head. Are you going to shoot it? Would you shoot it? Would you shoot if you saw this the mythical thing? And I told myself no. And, uh, and I had put my phone up uh, and hit video record. And I do have audio somewhere in iCloud of... I took a long video, it's just a blackness and it's got the last maybe two minutes of these sounds kind of moving. 
Um, so that was, you know, not the most exciting story, but that's kind of what kicked off this uh, kind of flurry of activity over the next three years. Um, anything from, you know, seeing kind of like impressions in the in the soft moss that look, you know, nothing like super definitive, like, man, that looks like a footprint, but, you know, a thousand things can when you're in the woods long enough. Um, we have our back 40 is uh, primarily swamp, and it's just it's the bedding area for deer. It's really prime bow hunting kind of area, and it's rare to go down in that area. Um, so over those years, when there's not a lot of people around, I, I was having, you know, some audio experiences. Uh, one night I had uh, something go moo, like someone was imitating a cow over here. And then about five minutes later, I'm like, man, that was somebody just going moo. And then in the middle, kind of where those three sounds came from the first time, something went cock a doodle doo, just like, like Looney Tunes, like the, you know, Bugs Bunny or something. And I'm like, okay, I had problems with some locals just making fun of me because they saw a Bigfoot sticker on my water bottle, you know, and I spent a lot of time discerning between uh, my mental state, people pranking me, what I'm really hearing. And then the third one off off to the right flank, I'll call it, goes ar, 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 like imitating a coyote. And I was like, ha ha, that was the three sounds I got. And it was humorous. There was no kind of threat to it or anything. But uh, so fast forward to the last experience. Now this was, uh, I would say, late July, early August of last year, 2021, um, right in the height of like mosquito season. It's just hot and sticky. And, uh, one of my old hippie friends had told me, you know, long ago in a conversation, they were like, man, if you ever have a Sasquatch experience, leave them garlic cloves. They'll love you forever. Like if you're in the swamp, like leave them garlic cloves. And it just stuck in my mind. And I always, I was always forgetting when I was at the store, and then one day I was just like, man, I don't know, what could it hurt? I was, you know, like, keep things away. I need some garlic in my life, whatever. So I bought these garlic cloves, and I had kind of just had them stinking up my pockets and stuff for a while. And uh, I had some trail cams I had to move in the out in the swamp and uh, had a big predator problem with uh, coyotes, you know, and I'm very protective of, like, my my – little birds and rabbits and stuff like that. I love the small game, you know, and I'm, and the, the predator stuff. I just kind of like, I had some predator hunters just kind of really pushing their way onto our property. And I was like, you know, I don't want to take care of my own predator problem. So I kind of reset some of my trail cams in areas that were low, uh, that I thought, you know, I might catch, see if there's coyote bobcat coming through that area. I was all setting these cameras and, uh, and I, put one in and I had this pocket full of garlic cloves and I just I had accepted um you know I've got proof enough from these last couple of years that this is a reality of my life and these beings are real you know and I just kind of like come to the conclusion I really don't want to get a visual because I'm back pretty far back by myself and I feel like our understanding of a comfortable distance is good enough for me. Um, and when I go back into the swamp alone uh, in the dark, I'm one of the, I don't know if anybody else will do it. I'm just one of the ones dumb enough. Um, you know, it, it's always feeling of like I'm being escorted or something. And um, so it was getting kind of, getting kind of dark. It was when the days are really long. So it was probably like eight, eight thirty, and I was getting kind of nervous and I, I set this last trail camera and the and the squirrels were going just berserk around me and I was like, well, so much for being stealthy, you know. It's like call it Squirrel War Three. They're just chattering and you know I'm like, okay guys, I'm here, you know. You got me and I'm like, damn squirrels and the squirrels have just been giving me hell all summer. Red squirrels in my barn and and uh, and I, I came back onto our main trail and I stepped onto the trail and the squirrel chatter just stopped and everything got really kind of silent. And I had like three or four cloves of garlic left and, and into the main body, the thickest part of the swamp where no one really goes. Um, I, I kind of set a couple of cloves of garlic out and just kind of made a statement like, hey, these are gifts. Uh, 
thanks for letting me, you know, just sound like a crazy person in the woods talking to myself and saying things out loud because uh, through all the research, you know, I've just kind of figuring like if things do mind speak, that's nothing I really want to experience. So we'll just talk out loud. And um, <laughs> I, like I got enough voices in my head, you know, I don't need another one. Yeah, I would be able to figure out which was which at that point you know they probably know that already but um so everything kind of goes silent and uh and I'm like you know it didn't really strike me as like that you know I've listened to a lot of stories and that that silence that people talk about where just the woods goes dead and the kind of the fear projection I didn't I didn't really have that but I was like oh man cool the squirrels stopped chattering you know it was just striking that that they weren't chattering anymore and I found myself in this area that I had been a bunch of times, but it just, it looked different. And it was getting twilight, kind of this humid fog over the, the swamp and and uh, just mosquitoes everywhere. And I, I'm like, okay, I got to leave these garlic pieces. And then I hear this, this thump behind me. I took a couple steps and I turned back over my shoulder and there was like cleanly ripped in half a uh, red squirrel and just the back legs, its tail and it's abdomen like guts hanging out and i'm like all right did a bird you know i'm looking up like did an eagle drop it i was just going through my mind of all these things and and it i was like oh man something fast enough to snatch a red squirrel fresh and it felt like they just went hey squirrels bothering you look at this and i was like Possibly, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like, and I, you know, just this, uh, like, feeling of, I, I'm always feeling like I'm being watched out there. I'm getting kind of goose pimples talking about it. And, um, you know, and it, it takes a lot to rattle me. Um, I'm, a, you know, I've been uh, in a couple crappy places in the world, rough deployments. Uh, you know, I'm a combat wounded guy, and, and I've had my brain rattled a few times. So, you know, I, I kind of, like, don't necessarily trust myself sometimes when I'm out there. Like, you know, there's times where you can think, you know, a, a black squirrel's a huge buck or, you know, blue jay is something, you know, so I'm always kind of skeptical of things. Uh, so, and I, and it was just getting dark and I was like, I, I, I kind of came to this conclusion and through hearing stories, I like the nighttime's not mine anymore. I don't just aimlessly walk around like I used to. Um, with one eye shot and just, you know, being out there. But I was in the swamp longer than I felt comfortable. And I was like, I got this last little bit of light and I've got to get up to my barn. And it's a, it's a path that comes out. And then I hit a bean field, take a left, walk the bean field up, go up the hill. And then I'm back in my barn and it's safe zone. Um, and I, so I turned my red headlamp on, you know, and it shows eye shine really good if I see a deer or anything. And when I get up to the bean field, and it's really getting hazy, I get up to the bean field just about maybe 20 yards in front of me, and it looked to be about 10 foot tall, just one red large eye shine. And I just got wide-eyed, and I hit my white light, and there was nothing there. And I turned that light back off and I got freaked out. I was like, all right, I'm out of here. You know, I just started, I was like, thanks everybody for playing along. And I'm just heading on home, heading home. Thanks for letting me give you garlic or whatever. Check my cameras and talking the whole way up. And I get, um, I get up to the barn. It's like huge sense of relief. I'm back in home base. And I, and it, I was like, man, I just couldn't stop thinking about that squirrel and what, type of athleticism it would take to grab a red squirrel you know they're just i mean like a red squirrel if it came running at a full-grown human you're like whoa 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 you know it's they're just squirrel squirrely for lack of a better word uh and and i i was and i said it out loud i was like hey that squirrel as the relief came in i was like now oh, that was impressive and right from the valley right behind my barn uh there was a chirp, like a, my dad does a squirrel chirp. I can't do it, but it's like a whistle chirp. Sounds just like a, when a squirrel does one little blast. And it sounded like it was on a PA system. And just whoop, right after I was like, that was impressive. And I was like, all right, good night. We're going inside. And uh, I, you know, 
I've, I've slept with one eye open for a long time, but um, I guess to wrap it up, you know, what I've kind of taken from these experiences that I've been having there is like, I get a strange sense of comfort and I feel like I have a safe place that these beings might travel through. And I would really like to keep it that because, you know, I've been out there by myself for a long time and if anything wanted to hurt me, it had a million chances and obviously, you know, I've never laid eyes on anything. I've had some things that I just made the conscious decision not to look at out of the corner of my eye, uh, but you know, they could have me at any time. And I feel like we have a little bit of a, an understanding and um, you know, people scare me. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks. To... Oh yeah.